Hi, welcome to An Atheist Asks. I'm Christy. Thanks for coming by my channel. In today's episode, I want to look at a piece of social research that was presented by William Lane Craig in a video on YouTube. This research is interesting to me because as a social scientist, I've started to investigate why people of faith move into atheism. And I was looking for research into that to see what there was out on the internet when I found this video by Craig and what got me really excited about it is that one it's a piece of research into atheism which there isn't a whole lot of especially from a qualitative perspective and the other thing was that they really got a lot of things wrong and I was excited for the opportunity to make corrections and to really break down some stereotypes and bad bad science it's actually not even science what they're doing it's really just confirmation bias with cherry picking but not everything they do is incorrect, like some of their findings I've also found in my research. So I want to point out where they get the findings right, but how they interpret them incorrectly. And he is presenting the research of Alex, Larry Alex Taunton and his article that was published in The Atlantic entitled, Listening to a Young Atheist Lessons for a Stronger Christianity. You can kind of already see the bias that I mentioned previously. Now, the problem as I see it is, as I said, they go out and they do, uh, Taunton goes out and he does some research, but because his worldview is so predetermined, and because William Lane Craig's worldview is also incredibly predetermined, it's a really good case study in how findings that actually, in terms of some of the things they found, I agree with their observations. It's just how they interpret it is bizarre as far as I'm concerned, and I want to help uh, show how bizarre it is by pointing it out from my position as a social researcher and I've published uh, two book chapters and two journal articles using focus group research in how people come to political decisions and so I think I've got more of a background in terms of that sort of research approach than either of the two men speaking. I'm going to break the Craig video up into different segments and they're about a minute or two each, and then I'm going to provide a bit of a response to each one following. So let's start off, I think it's just easiest to get going to see where the bias comes in by listening to the first segment. He says we launched a nationwide campaign to interview college students who are members of the Secular Student Alliance, or Free Thought Societies. These college groups are the atheist equivalents to Campus Crusade, they meet regularly for fellowship, encourage one another in their unbelief, and even proselytize. They are people who are not merely irreligious, they are actively, determinedly irreligious. The problem that I basically have here is that they seem to see atheism as an inverted form of Christianity. By assuming that your opponents are exactly like you, but reversed, you really don't have room for the kind of subtlety and differences of worldviews that atheists have from theists. When they try to understand atheism, they can't kind of help but put something like God back into it because they just, I think they really can't understand what world, a world without God would even look like. And here's what they learned, and he shares seven um, items of the profile of these students. Number one, they had attended church. He found that most of our participants had not chosen their worldview from ideologically neutral positions at all, but in reaction to Christianity. So most of these students were once church-going folks. I don't know that that's why that's really surprising to them, but it's not particularly surprising to me or I think to most people who are atheists. Second, the mission and message of their churches was vague. These students heard plenty of messages encouraging social justice, community involvement, and being good, but they seldom saw the relationship between that message, Jesus Christ, and the Bible. This makes me think that these students predominantly came out of mainline churches, non-evangelical churches, where you have the emphasis on doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, or being involved in bringing about God's kingdom through social justice and uh, aiding the poor, and being a good 
person. And if that's the case, you can understand why they would see this as just utterly irrelevant to belief in Jesus Christ and the Bible. What these churches are preaching is just a sort of polite, warmed-over humanism with Christian trappings. And obviously, you don't need to believe in Jesus Christ or even God in order to be a good person, be involved in social justice, um, or try to love your neighbor as yourself. So it's no wonder they saw the uh, message that the church was giving them as irrelevant to the person of Jesus Christ and to God. One thing that is interesting in that segment is that it confirms a pattern I see in my observations, which is that when people who were raised with Christianity start to meet people from outside of other faiths, or they go to the military, or they go to university, this contact with people of different faiths has an impact, especially if they have been isolated and only around people they knew. So. Um, the idea that morality is found in a lot of different places and not just Christianity is something that for people in a very isolated worldview um, before they became atheists, that is actually quite a surprise to them when they are confronted with people who they think are really nice but disagree with them about religion. It becomes an opening for them to question the claims of particular salvation that they're doctrine their particular church teaches is only for them. And that does seem to have an impact on kind of breaking apart a little bit some people's hold on Christianity. Then Craig just bullshits. He just makes stuff up completely <laughs> out of thin air. Um, I don't see any evidence in the article and he doesn't present any evidence that these students are from mainline churches. I think this is his wishful thinking and he just wants to project the idea that his church and his approach is the only one where you have true Christianity and that these warmed over secularist churches that have trappings of Christianity are just what's wrong. So we can really discount all of that as crap. Thirdly, they felt their churches offered superficial answers to life's difficult questions. When our participants were asked what they found unconvincing about the Christian faith, they spoke of evolution versus creation, sexuality, the reliability of the biblical text, Jesus as the only way, etc. Some had gone to church hoping to find answers to these questions. Others hoped to find answers to questions of personal significance, purpose, and ethics. Serious-minded, they often concluded that church services were largely shallow, harmless, and ultimately irrelevant. Now in this segment, I actually see some of the same topics coming up in atheist stories that Craig points out from Taunton's article here. Namely that when people who were Christians and raised as creationists go out looking for evidence of creationism and are confronted with the overwhelming evidence for the theory of evolution, they become convinced by the evidence because evidence is convincing because it's produced by the scientific method, which has checks and balances and isn't just wishful thinking. Another common a uh, topic that I've heard, especially with younger atheists, I'd say, let's say under the age of 30, are true concerns about Christianity and homophobia, Christianity and preventing gay rights from advancing. That is a topic that is, I think, a, a real wedge issue for young people and claims of religion. And I think that Taunton is, is onto something there. He just misses, and Craig misses, the, the point of it. The students also mention that the Bible is unreliable as a text, which is another thing that I commonly find in people's deconversion stories. And then uh, there was the point about Christianity being the only way, and I've addressed that a little bit prior. Four, they expressed their respect for those ministers who took the Bible seriously. Without fail, our former church attending students expressed positive feelings for those Christians who unashamedly embraced biblical teaching. Michael, a political science major at Dartmouth, told us that he is drawn to Christians like that, adding, quote, I really can't consider a Christian a good moral person if he isn't trying to convert me.
End quote. What Craig is saying is that atheists secretly want to have people preach Jesus to them. And that's not at all what I find. Number five, ages 14 to 17 were decisive. For most the high school years were the time when they embraced unbelief. So it wasn't in the university environment. It was already uh, in the context of the local church while in high school. The idea that the ages of 14 to 17 being decisive is something that is supported a little bit in my data. I think this might be actually a symptom of their sampling bias. And that's because when I look at the data, I actually see people deconverting sometimes over the course of their lives, five, seven, even 10 years before they admit to themselves that they have reached the point where they are now atheists. But for especially young men, and this makes me suspect that perhaps their sample is over-representing men and under-representing women. Um, younger, the sort of teenagers, 14 to 17, um, do talk about having these questions. And I think that for people who would, for, for especially men, but anyone who would be an active member of a secular alliance in university, they would have been the kind of person who became an atheist in their teens. But that's not the only time people discover questions about their religion and have really serious doubts and end up on a path that leads them to atheism. That path can happen at any point. And any point means any point. I've, you know, I've got stories of people in their 50s. I've got stories of people in their 20s. I've got stories of people in their 40s. So um, this, they get right when you talk about a certain kind of atheist. But if they think that the ages of 14 to 17 are the danger zone, and that somehow if you can make it past that, people will stay Christians for their whole lives, they're really wrong. Six, the decision to embrace unbelief was often an emotional one. With few exceptions, students would begin by telling us that they had become atheists for exclusively rational reasons. But as we listened, it became clear that for most, this was a deeply emotional transition as well. This phenomenon was most powerfully exhibited in Meredith. She explained in detail how her study of anthropology had led her to atheism. When the conversation turned to her family, however, she spoke of an emotionally abusive father. Quote, it was when he died that I became an atheist, end quote, she said. Taunton says, I could see no obvious connection between her father's death and her unbelief. Was it because she loved her abusive father? Uh, abused children often do love their parents. And she was angry with God? because of his death? No, Meredith explained. I was terrified by the thought that he could still be alive somewhere." End quote. So she decided to become an atheist to get rid of her father. And so you can see in these stories deeply emotional factors that contribute toward unbelief. But of course that's not socially acceptable. So one will often mask or characterize one's transition to unbelief as something that's purely intellectual because that elevates you in the eyes of your peers. You're a thinking, reflective person who follows reason unflinchingly to its end, uh, thereby masking some of the deep emotional reasons that might actually lead to unbelief. Right. The idea that be people become atheists for emotional reasons is bullshit. It's just bullshit. And this is probably the most egregious example where they go in looking for an answer and create the data to find it. It's also really sexist because if you read the article, you'll notice that in total there are three women mentioned in the article. Two of them appear only in one section and that's in the emotional trauma. They basically picked out two women's cases to highlight as evidence that atheists go through emotional trauma. First, in terms of people going through tra childhood trauma, lots of people go through tra childhood trauma. And so the, the emphasis they place on this, whether it's the loss of a parent, um, this, uh, another girl had, um, I think her mother had a suicide attempt, very tragic, horribly tragic things. But that is not the basis of people's atheism. If you listen to people's stories, and this comes down to Craig and Taunton not listening to their participants, what they would have heard, and that's what I hear, is people having 
both an intellectual and an emotional process of searching for God. For people who eventually call themselves atheists, they announce that they don't find evidence and they keep searching for God and they keep not finding evidence. People, I think, if you really talk to, to believers who believe sincerely, their emotions are almost the last thing that, that, that go. It's the rational stuff and the arguments that come first, and then the emotions follow. So I really have to just say that um, Craig's wrong. He's completely wrong in this, and it comes from his biases and his inability to listen to atheists as anything more than a mirror back to his own Christianity and how good he is. Finally, number seven, he says, the internet factored heavily in their conversion to atheism. When our participants were asked to cite key influences in their conversion to atheism, people, books, seminars, etc., we expected to hear frequent references to the names of the new atheists. We did not. Not once. Instead, we heard vague references to videos they had watched on YouTube or website forums. I did think it was pretty humorous that they expected to hear students just repeat the name of, of Dawkins or um, Sam Harris because again this is a, a projection. They are the kinds of people who appeal to authority and they appeal to people staying, saying things that they agree with and then they'll cite that other person. They of course expect atheists to do that too but what they don't get is that people who do this, who go through this process, are self-taught. Atheists tend to be highly autodidactic, and so it's not at all surprising to me that people didn't go, oh, Richard Dawkins, or oh, Sam Harris, or even oh, Christopher Hitchens. Rather, those individuals were probably pieces of information they picked up along the way, but they're not going to go to Richard Dawkins and just read Richard Dawkins and follow Richard Dawkins the way that I think William Lane Craig probably thinks people follow him, maybe. And this underlines the importance of those of you in this class who are involved in these sorts of forums and even posting these kind of videos on YouTube. This is a tremendous ministry, I think, that reaches um, the 20-somethings and younger uh, who are frequenting those sites. Is the internet important to atheism and deconversion? Yes. Yes, very much so. Um, you see in the data, or at least I see in the data, maybe someday you will when I finally get around to presenting it, but there is a bit of a, a generational change. You've got people who talk about becoming atheists before the internet, and they are more likely to discuss important books or other kinds of public communication that's not digital. Once you get into a generation of people who have become atheists while watching the internet, then yes, atheist YouTubers, um, The Amazing Atheist, Thunderfoot, um, Dark Matter 2525, these people in stories that I'm listening to from about one or two years ago do come up by name as being very important. What Craig gets wrong in his conclusions is he thinks that the power is YouTube. The power is the medium. The power is a social network. And the reason people are becoming atheists after watching YouTube videos is because they're on YouTube. What he misses is that people who um, were Christians who use the internet to study apologetics and to learn apologetics and then learn the arguments against it, and then they start realizing the arguments against apologetics is more serious and more evidence and based and more logical than their own arguments, is it's the content is the content of YouTube that changes people's minds, not the fact that they're watching it on YouTube. And I guess as atheists, we're really lucky because we have an opportunity to use my knowledge to get the word out and to get more content out that increases people's understanding of science, logic, philosophy, and nature in general. Um, and so I think that uh, we're winning on that, on that score. Taunton, reflecting upon the results of his unscientific uh, survey, says these students were above all else, idealists who longed for authenticity, and having failed to find it in their churches, they settled for a non-belief that while less grand in its promises, felt more genuine and attainable. Houghton's conclusions are complete and utter bullshit. Um, no, they're really not idealists. If anything, they are incredibly practical, rational, and grounded people who want real evidence that is triangulated through other people's observations and the scientific method. 
Towton says there's something winsome, even irresistible, about a life lived with conviction. Atheists choose truth, and they choose to limit their claims to things that they know are true. That is a life lived with conviction. That's where I'm going to wrap up my critique of the research. As you can see, I've pointed out a lot of differences between where I'm coming from and my evidence and my approach, listening to what people are saying versus the Towton and Craig approach, which deals mainly with cherry picking evidence and predetermining conclusions and then shaping things to find them. Now, if you are more interested in the research than I am doing, stay tuned to this channel. I'm going to be putting things out probably around November time, that's the current plan, um, about the research I've done, my preliminary findings and where I hope to take it in future. And before I end this video, I just want to do a few really sincere shout outs to people who have been very helpful for me and for this channel. I think this is now my seventh video and every single one has gotten better. I'm in focus now. This is really important. A <laughs> big change from my first video. I'm in focus. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to my friend Thomas, who's been absolutely in invaluable in terms of providing me with advice in the last two weeks on how to do my setup, my computer setup, my lighting. Thomas, you rock. It all looks so much better, and it's really thanks to you. Another person I want to thank immensely is Steve Shives. I joined him on his Patreon a hangout, really just to be there as a sort of, you know, a fan and admirer of all the content he puts out. But he very kindly allowed me to plug my show and plug my series of different atheist reads that's also here on this channel. So thank you, Steve, for being so supportive. And if you don't know Steve Shives, please check him out. I'll put a link in the description box below. The last person I want to do a shout out to is the website that I've recently found on YouTube called Atheist Analysis. I wanted to make sure I got that right because uh, there's a lot of A's in it. And I'm going to put a link to the description box there too. If you're looking for new great atheist content, please check them out. Please subscribe. And speaking of subscribing, thank you so much for everyone who's subscribed. Thank you so much to everyone who's liked a video, retweeted a video, shared it on Facebook. You guys are making all the difference to this channel. And I thank you so very, very much. This has been Christy with An Atheist Asks. Thanks for watching. Thank you.